What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young, bright, and long-time assistant coach. I know you say, how is he young and long-time? Anytime you've been in this business over 10 years, you consider a long-time assistant coach. Um, he a, has a tremendous work ethic and, uh, and passion. Uh, just not only a recruiter, great X and O guy, great game guy, great development guy, a future head coach in this business, by my opinion, and a uh, Portland, Maine native. Now, Chris is a uh, former standout at Notre Dame and came back home uh, to play at Maine. He was actually Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of Maine in 2000. I uh, finished up in 2005 uh, playing for Coach Woodward uh, at Maine. Um, after that, that one, after he finished his playing career, of course, everyone wants to play professionally. Uh, he went into corporate America uh, for almost 10 months um, before receiving a call uh, from his head coach and uh, from his former head coach uh, in Coach Woodward and, uh, you know, asked him about joining the staff. Uh, There's something he decided to do. So in 06, taking the leap of faith and probably, you know, following his path uh, where he is now, um, spent five years at the University of Maine as an assistant coach. Uh, before heading up to Vermont um, in, in 2011, where he's an assistant coach for John Becker, where he did an outstanding job from 2011 to 2014. And then he goes to Northeastern University, where he's presently at, where he's just finished up his sixth season, going into uh, going into his seventh season, uh, where he spent, um, you know, majority of that time as an assistant. Now the last two seasons, he's the associate head coach. Uh, we had a chance to work for Billy Corn, who I think is one of the most underrated coaches, in which Northeastern is one of the you know best staffs, not in just the uh, Colonial uh, Athletic Association, but one of the best staffs in the country. I want to say welcome to the show, Chris Markwood. I appreciate you having me, LB. Yeah, man. So, you know what? We're going to jump right into it, Chris, man. We're going to get unmasked. One of the first questions, like, you went from player to not even a year later going into college coaching. And you probably had some guys that you played with on that team um, were now, you know, a little bit older, but you were one year removed from those guys. Um, but, you know, now you sit on a different side. So you play for Coach Woodward. Now you're going to get ready to work for him. Like, there's no handbook to being a college coach. Um, tell me about your first day, the first week, first month, uh, possibly um, after things are done with human resources or orientation. Especially when no one gives you direction. You saw it. You saw the assistant coaches that were there. But now, bam, it's there. Tell me what's that like. Yeah, it's it's a whirlwind for sure. I mean, my head uh, was definitely at that. I mean, it was a long time ago now. But my head was definitely spinning. I do remember that. Uh, you know, because when you go from being a player uh, and that quickly jumping into the business, you know, it's just a different world, as we all know, uh, coach, the coaching side of it. And, uh you know, so my head was spinning, I think, as quickly as possible. You're trying to, you know, get to get to know the guys. And in that sense, I was in a, you know, a little bit ahead of the game because, as you said, I played with a lot of them. So, uh, but you want to get around the new guys that maybe you didn't get a chance to play with and start to build that relationship. Uh, I think you want to, you know, learn the verbiage and, and just kind of everything that they use um, when it comes to the basketball side of it. And I think you – you don't really know what you're doing, but you can help and you can ask questions and, and uh, you, you want to be there to help the other assistant coaches, the head coach, obviously, uh, and do whatever you can to kind of help help the program move forward. Awesome, man. So now we know recruiting is the uh, lifeline of college athletics. Got to get good players um, and good people if yeah. you want to be successful in this business. I mean, they go hand in hand. Um, it's you know no wonder you know the teams that are successful usually have good people, good play, really good players, really yeah. good people, um, and, and they usually buy in. But like, what was your best and worst recruiting story that you may have had over the years? Man, best recruiting story. Uh, I 
don't know if I would word it as the best. Uh, it was a good a good story we had when I was at Vermont uh, with Coach Becker. Uh, was recruiting a, 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 who ended up being a great player. He ended up coming to Vermont playing for for uh, Coach Becker up there for four years. Had a great career. But we went up to his name was Trey Bell Haynes, a really good guard for them, all league player. Uh, I had been recruiting him for a while uh, throughout the season, uh, and, and coach hadn't seen him yet. So we fly up to Toronto to go watch him in the tournament. Um, and, you know, we make the, make the trip, get up early, fly, drive, get, get into Toronto, drive up to the gym. And, you know, we're all excited, all hyped to see him play. Uh, you know, get through the first half. He's playing well. Uh, right away in the second half, bam. Tussle starts to happen. Guys are getting into it. And he wasn't in the initial tussle. Uh, <laughs> But he comes over trying to be a good teammate, help help his boy out. And, you know, he gets into it, pushes the kid to the floor. The ref throws him out of the game. And this is the first time I, you know, first time Coach Becker's seen the kid play. And I've been the one kind of talking to him. And I'm like, man, Coach is going to fire me over this. You know, I'm flying him all the way out here, spending all this money to, to, to see this kid. Uh, so I remember that being a crazy story just because when you're in it, you're like, you just flew your boss all the way up here to see the kid for the first time. And, he gets thrown out of a game. So that, that wasn't a great feeling. Uh, but as I said, it ended up working out. You know, he, he had a great career at Vermont, was a tremendous player, and uh, ended up committing to us not too too long after that that whole ordeal. Uh, so that, that's always a, a story I like to tell. Um, our worst, you know, the toughest ones with, with recruiting, as we all know, as assistant coaches, like the ones you put in the most time with, it gets down to the 11th hour, you're in the mix, you're one of the final two or three, and you know, they, they, they go somewhere else or if you had to decommit or something like that. Those are always tough. Uh, but we did have uh, – we had a kid not uh, when I was here at Northeastern uh, who we thought, like, came on an official visit. It went well, or at least we thought it went really well. Uh, you know, he, he came up with his, with his mom and, and uh, you know, it's the last day of the visit. And we're asking him if there's anything he needs – Anything else he needs from us, you know, don't leave with any any questions unanswered. And uh, he hits one of the other assistants, and he's like, you know, basically like, you know, get that graphic ready for me. You know what I'm saying? So he he's trying to signal to us that he's about to commit. So, we, we, you know, we're thinking we're in the clear. I'm about to get the kid a really good player. Uh, and then, like, a, like, the next day, he commits to another school. And, and, and the assistant on our staff, like, spent the whole night getting the graphic ready and all this, sent it to him, and the kid was all hyped about the graphic. So, like I said, we think we're getting him, and the next day, commit somewhere else. And he, he, was, he was a great player, ended up having a really good career. Uh, fortunately for us, we had, we had a couple other kids lined up behind him, and one of the kids came and, and had a great career for us as well, helped us get to the NCAA tournament. But uh, that, was, that was a tough one. That's definitely one that sticks out. Tough, and then you still end up with a good player, so that, work, that works out either way. Uh, still successful. Um, you know, like, we all know that in this business, man, like, you know, people have no idea uh, how much time did you invest. You talked about that a little bit, investing, not only just in recruiting, but, you know, uh, you're dealing with scouting reports, you know, on-court stuff, off-court. Um, you know, you, 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 you know, you're working 355, 360 days out the year, 12, 15-hour days. I mean, the, you know, even when you're on vacation, you, you still trying to set up that unofficial visit, kid coming to campus, you're still talking to him. Like, what did you have to give up um, or oh, sacrifice, I say sometimes, achieving your current level of success? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, for people that are looking to get into it, I think it's big that they understand. Uh, you know, for me, I got a young family. I got two two young daughters. One, one of my oldest just turned five, and I got another one that's about to turn two. So just with the hours that come with the job, uh, if you want to be good at it, it's just, it's just the reality of it. You're going to work a lot. You have to put in a lot of time. Even when you're home, you're still working. Uh, so I, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, just the, the, the sacrifice that, you know, the time with your family. You just don't get a lot of quality time with them. And it's important that the short amount of time you get, you got to be efficient with it. You got to make the most out of it and try to put your work down for, even if it's an hour, like whatever you can, just to spend some time with your kids, with your wife. I uh, make the most of that. I would say that. And then along with that, it's, it's hard to maintain, like, friendships that you've had for, for a long time. Like, I, you know, my boys from high school and stuff like that that I was really close with, uh, you know, and still am, but 
don't get to see him as much as I would like. Um, you know, and it's really hard to to get up there and do the th you know do all the get-togethers that they're doing together. That that part of it's tough. You can't. It's really hard to maintain relationships outside of the business uh, that you normally would if you were working a nine to five. You know what I'm saying? That 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 part for me is hard because of how close you know I am with those guys. I, I feel you on that, man. I truly understand that. Now, this is the this is the one that you know scouting reports. It's uh, you know people have no idea that um, if you look at it on the TV or you end the game live, you you can almost tell who scout it is because they are they they're up, they're yelling, they're screaming. Um, they, you know the players they're talking to the players when they come to the bench and and and, and they're a little bit more active um, when it's their scout. Um, you know, sometimes, you, you know, you look at a scout and you say, um, man, I know I nailed this one. We had all the calls. We had all the actions, you know. But then you go and play, and the kids, they've got to play the game. And it's like, yeah. you know, I can't believe you guys are playing at this level. And, and, and you lose. I mean, or yeah. it's closer than you think. And then sometimes, you know, you go through a scout report and you done nailed all the guys, eight, nine guys, and then there's that one guy who hasn't really played or a guy who's three for his last 35 from three. He yeah. said, Coach, he really struggling shooting. So, you yeah. know, you know, we, we can we can contest, but we don't have to be there on the catch all the time. And then he makes three or four. Mm -hmm. Tell me what was your best and worst scout report that you think you've had over the years? Oh man, like you said, I've been doing this for a little while now. So uh you No, know, I would like in our league, and you know Lamar, because you you coached in it for a while. Uh and you know how good Tony Shaver's teams were at William and Mary. Uh and just how good they were offensively. I think, you know, either their, their coaches, Coach Shavers last year there, the year before, they were like the number one efficient offensive team in the country. Uh, so, and they always gave us fits since I've been here. Uh, I, I did feel like towards the end, like, you know, their last couple of years there, we started to play really well against them. And, you know, just when you have a scout for three, four years in a row, it's just natural that you start to understand kind of what they're trying to do. And, have a really good sense there so I felt like you know by the end of that you know uh, we had them down to the best of our but now they were still tough and it was really hard to guard even though we felt I felt like you know I understood what they were trying to do um, but I, I do I, I felt and it's not when you do a scout as we all know not just me either it's our whole staff is working on it but uh, I felt we had a really good sense of what uh, what they were trying to do uh, so I guess that one kind of comes to mind first. Uh, as far as the worst, again, there's been a few of those over the years. Uh, we, had, we had a game this year, and like you were saying, like we ended up winning the game, but I felt terrible after the game. Uh, we played a team in a non-conference, and, and similar to the example you gave, kid had shot like two threes on the season, right? He comes in the game, had, was barely playing. Comes in the game, hits like, I think he hit like four threes against us. And uh, fortunately for us, we still won. But I, mean, I remember after the game, like, you know, you're apologizing to everybody. Like, I didn't even have him on the scout, didn't have him on the board. Uh, that one was a little wild. And that happens every once in a while, especially in the non-conference. Uh, another one, a bigger one, though, uh, in terms of that, we played Kansas in the, in the NCAA tournament uh, a couple of years ago. And I thought, I thought we had them down going in. And, and you know, we obviously they were a great team. Uh, I think they were the four seed. We were 13 seed, really good. But, you know, we kind of held tough. We were down six or seven early in the second half. Uh, but then they just absolutely blew the doors off us. Like we, I mean, they ended up going on a big run in the second half. And we had no answers. And uh, that was one of those scouts where I felt like, you know, we had them down. We didn't play our best basketball. They played. Kansas basketball, and uh, but that was another one, you know, you just, especially on that stage where you want to get everything right, and, and it goes that way. Uh, that, that was a tough one for me. I remember watching that game, but I mean, like you said, like, it, they kind of, they took, you know, took it to another level, and that, a lot of times, just the biggest difference, and it has to be everything going right when you play those type of teams, yeah, especially no when it comes to, you can catch them every once in a while, but when they when the talent level kicks in, it's a little yeah, different. It, it uh, is what it is. But, but you, you still feel the same, though. It, it's no different. It, it's no different because we, yeah. we all think no matter what, when we play, we're the same level. 
we should go in and win. And, and, and that's how it should be. That's the competitive, that's the competitive side. Um, that's the passion you have. So that's, I, I truly, I truly understand what you're saying. Um, what's the biggest challenge you think you've experienced since you've been in college coaching? Biggest challenge, uh, I'll tell you what, what we're going through right now is is one of the toughest ones, just kind of, you know, I think every school is different. Some schools are back to summer school. We're, we're not right now. Our summer school keeps getting pushed back. Uh, so this, is, this has been a big challenge for us, you know, along with everything else that's going on with the social injustice. And all. I mean, it's just, it's been a crazy few months here. Uh, so this has been one of them. I would also say too, for me, I was in the, you know, I was in the business for 10 years before I had kids. Uh, so kind of figuring out that, you know, that work family, family balance, uh, just cause as we said earlier, like you, it's your whole life, man. It's what you do. You're on the road all the time. And I love what I do. So uh, it's constantly on my mind, even when I lay my head down and you know, to go to bed at night. Um, but finding that, like we said earlier, just finding that balance where like you're, you're efficient with your time and you're, you're making the most out of the time that you do get with your family. And, 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 and really, and really being cognizant of that. Awesome, man. I, I, I love the answer. Um, do you ever find that there are things about you that people might misunderstand? Like what are? Ah, uh, I would say for me, uh, I'm I'm a somewhat of a quiet guy, very reserved. Uh, I don't know if you know if people misunderstand that or how that's kind of taken, but. Uh, but I am. I mean, I, I grew up kind of a shy kid and, and, you know, I've definitely come out of my shell as I've gotten older, but, uh, you know, much more laid back and reserved. So I think that can sometimes maybe come across a certain type of way. Uh, but I think, you know, people that, that get a chance to know me or that, that, that you know, I do talk to, they, they see that, uh, you know, very, you know, I, if I know you, I'm very outgoing and, and uh, very easy to get along with. And, uh, and those types of things, but uh, I would say that that's just that's definitely one thing that can get misconstrued a little bit. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm a reserved guy. Yeah, I, I just say I I see you, and I used to be like he he's locked in, he's you know focused, especially yeah. on the road recruiting. I never saw anything wrong with that. I was just you know I wanted to see like you know what you thought, what what other people may have perceived, but I don't think yeah. they understand. You know, some people come in, they laugh, joke, and they get stuff done, but. Some guys are focused when they come in yeah. and they know what they're looking for. And um, I, I think sometimes when, when you when you reserve, you're not talking as much that people might say like, "Oh, he think he he this or that." And it's not like for me. And anybody that knows me knows that that is the farthest thing from the truth. That's just kind of who I am. It's who I've always been. So true, man. Um, we're all educators, man. We teach in this business. Um, you know, whether it's on the basketball court or off the court. But like, what do you try to teach your players besides? you know, basketball? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we try to teach them a lot of things. Uh, I think uh, the biggest thing, especially with the age, the ages that we're dealing with, uh, you know, you're taking over for for parents. Uh, and, and I think we're trying to guide them on the court, off the court, uh, you know, to make the right decisions, do the right thing, not always go for the, the easiest option or the, the low hanging fruit. I, th I think that's, that's a big deal, right? Because, uh, you know, 17, 18, 19-year-old kids learning how to, uh, you know, be persistent and go about things the right way, as I said, in all those different areas is is one of the biggest steps to them succeeding after they get out of college. So I think the more that, you know, you know, we talk about that a lot as a staff with our guys, and I think the more we can kind of guide them in that direction. I know it's a broad answer, but to me, that that's what it comes down to. No, that's actually also an answer. I, 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 I feel you. Um, what are your best and worst memories in coaching? Best memories? I think, you know, every year you get a graduating class and seeing those guys walk across the stage is uh, the most fulfilling uh, feeling you get. Uh, you know, for us here, I know every year we, we actually work our graduation. Uh, there's a guy on campus that puts it together and he asks, and it's something we've been doing, I think, since Coach McLaughlin was the who's the head coach at Dartmouth now. Uh, when he was associate head coach here, it started kind of with him, and we've been doing that since. And uh, to kind of you know to be there and watch your guys go across there and, and, and uh, you know receive that diploma after all the hard work they put in, 
that's that's one of the biggest accomplishments. I mean, obviously, the basketball side of it, you know, I've been fortunate to be on some teams that went to the NCAA tournament. Uh, and, and those are, you know, big time accomplishments and a lot of fun, you know, on the court for sure, obviously. Uh, what was the second part of that one? The worst, any worst memories of coaching? Worst memories. I mean, basketball, like we were, we were talking about earlier, I mean, we lost to Charleston. Uh, it's been three years now. Uh, that was a, that was a tough game. We played uh, really good basketball for three quarters of the game. Had a you know 15 point lead in the second half. Had a five point lead with 40 seconds left. Uh, ended up losing in overtime, and you know I got to give a lot of all the credit to Charleston. They played. They had an unbelievable team that year, uh, and they really you know they didn't hang their head. They fought back, and they got the better of us. But that was that was a tough one. And, and there's been a couple of those. We were at Vermont. We lost in the championship game on our home court to Albany. Uh, my second year there after going the year to the NCAA tournament the year before, that would have been back-to-back -back years there. So you know, anytime you lose those games where you're that close, uh, those ones kind of, you know, obviously stick out. True, but I, I can say it. You, don't, you can't say it. I, I watched that Northeastern Charleston game. Yeah. And I know Earl Grant and them, great team. They, actually, they're going to end up having three NBA guys on yeah, that, that from that, that, team, that team, which is possible. Yeah. Two already, you know, out uh, there, and, and, and Grant Riddle could be the third this year. But, like, you're talking about that team. Your, your team ended up – I think you should have won. You played your butts off. Officiating had a lot to do with that. I can say that. You can't say that now, but I can. Um, but I, I thought that was – I mean, that was a disservice for you guys, the way you played. And, um, you know, then, then you come back the next year, you end up winning the championship. So, that was a, that was a plus for you guys. Definitely, you, you know, but you would have liked to – to win that first year that you, you guys got there as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, everything works itself out, man. Everything happens for a reason. It's so true. So true. Um, because you know what? It kind of – the next year in our championship game, um, you guys were up. We came back. And, yeah. And you still ended up – you know, you ended up yeah. winning. So, you know, that's something you guys learned from the year before. So, that, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a plus, as you say. Um, and I, I asked this question just because – and we talked about biggest challenge, but this is a little different. What's the most stressful situation you think you faced? Most stressful. Uh, again, I know we talked, I mean, the, the stuff we're going on right now is tough, man. I mean, it, it's stressful just not knowing kind of what the future is going to hold and what it's going to look like. Uh, so, I, I mean, I know that's kind of the easy answer. The other ones I would say, uh, you know, I, I do think I'm, you know, I'm a, a loyal guy, like, and I've, been fortunate. I worked at three different schools, but when you take a new job, that's a stressful situation. Like when you got to go in, uh, you know, anytime you're leaving, I, and I've been blessed to work with great guys, work for great guys. Coach Woodward was, you know, the guy that kind of gave me a shot at the business. So I'm always, I always be indebted to him. Coach Becker is, you know, one of the bright young coaches in the country and has done an unbelievable job up there. And I absolutely love my time working with him and, and the guys on his staff. And then as you said, I think Coach Cohen's one of the best coaches in the country. So, been very fortunate. But anytime you you know you have to leave one of those spots, it's t that's a stressful situation. That's tough, man. That's tough. You know, saying bye to people that have given you an opportunity and have kind of helped move you along in your career. It's not an easy thing, and that's always been a hard thing for me. Yeah, I, I feel you on that one. You're, you're so you're correct on that one. Um, and this will be kind of interesting. What is the strangest, could be the wildest, craziest thing a player has done outside of uh, the basketball court? <laughs> that's a good, that's a tough one right there. Strangest thing? We had, uh, uh, oh, this was early in my career. <laughs> we had a kid, uh, he, everywhere he went, he brought a box of sugar with him. Like, you know, like you buy it at the grocery store, box of sugar. This is early on in my time here. Great. And let me say this, too. Let me preface. Unbelievable player, too. Um, like one of the best players I've been around. But he would travel everywhere with a box of sugar. So I'm talking every meal. Like, you know, pregame meal, we all do the same thing. You got pasta, chicken. But on his pasta with his red sauce, he would pull out his box of sugar and he would load that thing up with sugar all over his pasta 
and it would be other things too. But to me, that that was like I, I never seen nothing like that when I first saw. It. And the funny thing was, was after he was doing it, we had multiple guys doing it. Everybody was following along and doing. It. I'm like, yo, and so our trainer always looking at him crazy, you know. Uh, yeah, but uh, that was that was probably one of the strangest things I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, that's a little strange right there. Definitely agree with that. Um, and I, I like to um, oppose, oppose this question because I think you're going to be a head coach, and I mentioned it earlier. Um, what, what do you look – because you've been at Maine, you've been in Vermont, you've, you know, you, now you're at Northeastern. Um, what would you – what are you looking for? Let's say when you just get a chance to take over your program, what are you looking for from – uh, the school, like, uh, you know, in terms of looking at a school, because I mean, Northeastern is pretty good academic, Vermont is pretty good academic. Like, what are you looking for, like, from 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 the top to the bottom? Like, what, what are you looking for in a school? I think the biggest thing, you, you know, you've been in it long enough. I think you want stability in the administration. Uh, you you want to be working for, you know, people that have the right mindset and that are about the student athlete experience. Uh, obviously, it's, an, it's a huge plus if, you know, they're big on basketball being successful and they're going to support you there. I think that stuff is important. But, yeah, I'm not, to me, getting your education is number one priority in going to college and playing college basketball. So uh, I have really enjoyed being at schools that, you know, uh, take that really serious. Not that well, – I mean, every college takes it serious, but – uh, I think that's, that's, you know, now that I've been at Northeastern, which is, you know, a top 40, top 50 school academically, uh, I have really enjoyed that. Like, you know, we have kids that really prioritize and maximize uh, the opportunity that they have afforded to them here in, in the classroom. Awesome, man. And you, this might tie in hand to hand. You kind of mentioned it earlier. I mean, you've been to the NCAA tournament. You want to talk about, you know, seeing kids graduate. The biggest accomplishment you think you've experienced uh, since you've become a college coach? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say getting to the point that I'm at now, you know, being in it as long as I've been in it, uh, I think is it's been a gradual process for me. Uh, but as you know, LB, it's hard. It's hard to be in this business a long time. Man. It's hard to survive it. And, uh, I think just getting here has been great. Obviously, there's been a lot of, you know, big accomplishments on the court. As I said, getting a you know NCAA tournament from from our level is not easy, uh, and, and a lot of guys don't get to experience that. I was fortunate to experience it as a player and and also as a coach now. So I feel very blessed uh, to to do that. But I think just to get to the point where I'm at, and I'm still trying to push it and keep going, but. Uh, to me, that's a big accomplishment, man. I, I totally agree with you. Um, just going to take a little spin a little bit. Um, what movie or TV show title best describes your week? Man, I'm probably not the right one for this question, man. <laughs> I don't really watch a lot of uh, TV series. Uh, movie? When I do watch movies now, I used to watch more when I was younger, but uh, I would say Mission Impossible, I guess. We're giving every, everything that's going on right now, just trying to figure out, you know, when we're going to get back to some form of normalcy. And, uh, and, and like in those movies, it, it always ends up working out. I feel like this will too. Uh, but right now, things are crazy. You just don't know how it's going to go. So I guess I would say that. Just everything that we're dealing with with that, uh, especially with our situation with summer school, we just don't know what's going to happen with it. Uh, so uh, I would say, yeah, I guess Mission Impossible. I like it. I like it. Um, what's the uh, best, or oh, I'll say this, what's your favorite word or phrase? Uh, just in general or basketball? -wise? Yeah, like it would be with basketball. I mean, you might just walk around and you got a <laughs> word or phrase that you use, you know, but. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm an optimist. I try to stay positive. I, I guess with our guys, like I'm always, you know, I'm one of those guys like next play or keep your head up or just trying to stay as positive with our guys as possible. Uh, you know, because you know, as we all know, guys get down on themselves rather quickly, and just want to try to pick them up as much as I can. Good stuff, man. That's like it's simple, but it's still powerful. They just gotta understand that. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I would say, uh, 
I would say like, you know, there's just, there's no shortcuts to get, get to where you're trying to go and you got to create your own luck. Uh, I've heard that before. And I do think it's, again, it's simple, but it's real. Like you, you it's the grind, man. You, you want to, if you, if you have a goal that you've set for yourself, there's no easy way to get there. You're just going to have to, you know, keep your nose at the grind and work at it and, and, and really focus on, on that goal. And, uh, I would say that it's just, there's, you know, the, that's, that's one of the things that's really stuck with me. There's no sh- shortcuts to get to where you're trying to go. I love it, man. Um, what does success mean to you, Chris? Uh, having an impact on people, you know, uh, having a positive impact on people and helping people to me is su- uh, success. I think that's what we're all here to do. Uh, and, and we have different avenues or pathways to do that for us as coaches. You know, we're blessed to be in, our, you know, in a position where we can help young men uh, on that journey. So uh, I would say that, you know, helping guys, you know, chase and attain the goals that they've set for them and, and, and put them in a better position to, to do that. Um, where is your happy place? Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely with my family, with my two girls and my wife. Uh, you know, anytime we get some away time to do some things just as a family, I really – enjoy that uh, uh and outside of that i would say i'm a workout guy like i i really like you know getting out uh, and exercising whether it's for a run or in the weight room uh, i try to do that daily so for me getting getting headphones in getting a little music going and, and uh, getting after it uh, that's definitely a happy place for me good stuff man now i know you're not a self-promoter i've been around you um but if you had choose three adjectives to describe yourself uh what would they be which would you choose uh yeah I'd definitely say loyal uh hard working uh i would say caring too caring i love that caring definitely love that one um that's why a lot of people um uh, have said that as of late um what qualities do you value in um the people with whom you spend time uh, whew, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I would say people that are loyal, uh, selfless, uh, you know, about picking other people up. Uh, I, I love, like I said, I'm an optimist. I love positive energy. I want to be around people that, you know, kind of, you know, when, when you're around them, you feel uplifted and you feel energized to, to go about whatever it is you're doing at that moment. So I would say those are some key traits. Love it. Um, what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? You said what person or what was the last part? And or event has had the most influence on your life. Yeah, I would say for me, that goes hand in hand. Uh, um, biggest event, uh, I, w- I was adopted at a young age. Uh, so, um, and that kind of, you know, set the, set the, 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 the groundwork for where I am today. Uh, so my adopted parents took me in at a really young age um, and I was blessed, you know, I, my adopted parents got divorced when I was young. Uh, so, and they both remarried pretty quickly after that. So, and I was very fortunate and, and not everybody is, is as fortunate as me, but I have four amazing parents in my life growing up. Um, but, you know, obviously my mom and dad had, had the biggest influence. Both of them were pastors. Um, but, you know, my step parents too were, around me my whole life and had a huge influence on me. So I would say, I would say that, and, uh, you know, to go from being, being put up for adoption to, to, uh, in the position I was with the family that, that raised me, uh, and brought me along is, is, uh, I, I, I'm blessed, man. I'm blessed to be in that spot for sure. Awesome, man. That's, that's great to hear. Um, I love ending with this question just because I, I it brings you back a little bit. Like no, and you got in at a young age, but knowing what you know now, what would you tell your young self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much I would change with the kind of how I did it, but I would say I think it's easy in this business to kind of get caught up in the hype of trying to get the next job or anything like that. And uh, I'm trying to be. I think it's important that you just, again, you got a narrow focus on what you're doing and just 
you know, worry about the job that you're at, do the best job you possibly can there, and, and really just pour into the people that, that you're surrounded with at that position, at that, at that particular spot that you're at. Uh, whether it's the coaches that you're working with, administrators, obviously the most important being your players, uh, the student athletes. Uh, but I would say though, that that's the biggest thing I would probably say is just don't get caught up in the hype. Uh, just work at your craft as hard as you possibly can. Enjoy what you're doing and, and really pour into the people that you, you're fortunate to do it with every single day. Terrific answer, man. Um, I want to thank you again, Chris, for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Is there anything you want to say before we, uh, before we leave? Nah, just, uh, again, LB, really appreciate uh, you bringing me on here. I think it's a tremendous uh, platform for us coaches and for, for other people that are trying to get into it. There's just there's a lot behind the scenes that people don't know. So I think this is, is kind of putting that in the light, which I think is important uh, and, and, and will hopefully help you know, young cats coming up. Well, man, I want to thank you for those, for those great words. Um, and I want to thank the viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.